So uh, welcome to SciArc's Friday afternoon base camp. I think this is one of the last of the semester. Which oh, is standard reason. Yes, which in this case is on, I think, a topic that should interest everyone who is at the school um, at all levels, because at some point you do graduate, and then the question is what happens next and what your strategy is uh, for that next phase in your life. Uh, so the topic today is how to be in an office. Uh, you guys know me, I'm Marika Trotter, I'm the History Theory Coordinator here at SciArc, and I am flanked by two of the senior faculty members, design faculty members at SciArc, Margaret Griffin, FAIA. Um, to my left, Margaret has been running her own office. How long have you been running your own office, actually? Uh, I started it in 1998. So that is. It was Griffin Architects originally, and then uh, John joined in 2000, and so that's why it's Griffin Enright. That's why my name is first. Cause, that is uh, two reasons. One, I married a gentleman, and two, I started it. <laughs> Perhaps then I should say without further elaboration that I work with Tom Wiscombe in his firm named Tom Wiscombe Architecture. <laughs> Um, and then uh, uh, to my right is Dwayne Euler, AIA. Anti. Anti AIA, but a uh, registered architect. And Euler Wu has been uh, going a fair now for how many years? Uh, Jenny and I did our first project together in 2001, but we've kind of technically been in office since 2005. So two seasoned professionals who have a history of hiring and also firing SciArc uh, students and uh, alums. Um, as you the case may be. I haven't done that. Uh, in our office, I hire and John fires. <laughs> ah. Um, and just so you know, you guys know me here as a history theory <laughs> person, but um, before I went back to academia, I did spend about 15 years in practice where I did hire and fire. Um, I have myself been hired. Uh, I have never been fired, but I, there's one time I definitely should have been fired for sure. I think I was just lucky. Um, and I currently do now hire and uh, fire for, uh, for Tom Wiscombe Architecture. So we come to you with ready experience on this topic. And I think I want to start out today by posing just one question to get us warmed up. I thought we might actually kind of start with Margaret um, and then uh, Dwayne, and then I'll see if I have anything to add once you guys have said your piece, which is, what is your number one piece of advice for these fine, bright-eyed, and bushy-tailed students sitting before us today? Um, about how, not, not to get, let's not talk about yet about how to get hired. Let's also not talk about how to get fired. Both of those are useful skills. But could we just talk about first how to be in an office? Uh, so from my perspective, I was thinking about this topic and I thought, well, it's kind of a strange thing because like how to be in an office presupposes you, you, you are um, somehow entitled to be in an office, but I, I don't think that's the case. So I don't think that anyone is entitled to be in an office. And, and, and first of all, I think like, I don't know, maybe it's more about culture. Um, so we like to think of our place where we work as more like a studio than an office. So that's number one. So maybe it's not even an office at all. Maybe it's a studio. What's the difference between an office and a studio? I would say it's an atelier. It's a place where we do creative work. It's um, maybe an office is more possibly corporate. Maybe an office is more nine to five. I think an atelier is a place where um, um, there's a kind of a buy-in of a, of a kind of vision of what you're working on. So I think office culture is, there's different kinds of office culture. There's like, uh, let's say, for lack of a better way of understanding it, like there's a large kind of corporate, there's maybe middle size, and then there's maybe boutique firms. So I, I think like, to me, it's less about how to be in an office and it's more about how to think of, uh, uh, 
working for whoever you're going to work for as an extension of your education, right? Like choosing the next lessons that you want to learn. What, what do you want to learn next? What, to me, that has to do with who might you want to learn it from. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think when I was thinking about where I wanted to try to work, when, when I was in your uh, situation, I was trying to imagine what was the next lessons that I need to learn. And different people want to learn different lessons, and that's, that's, that's as it should be, right? Like, so if you want to learn about big buildings and you want to really work on big buildings, well, maybe a bigger office is better. If you want to have your own firm one day, maybe a smaller office is better. You can see how to have your own firm. Um, if you, maybe you want to have some experience at a big firm and at a small firm, like I think thinking of your next set of experiences, um, both, both as a student in school and as a graduate, is about constructing your continued education, um, in my mind. So number one tip on how to be in an, in an office or a studio or an atelier is put yourself in the mode of learning. Yeah, figure out. Yeah, figure out what's your next experience. Because uh, you know, in architecture, part of your pedigree is uh, not just where you went to school, not just your portfolio, but who you worked for. I, I think in architecture, there's a kind of pedigree to who you work for, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, so. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can answer it a lot differently. I, I think. Um, I so agree with that. Like it, it, it's funny how some so many people get out of school, and um, they think I'm I'm going to get a job, like a just a job. And it, I, I, you know, maybe one way to answer that is to say, you're not going out to get a job. You're going out to set the trajectory for the rest of your life. Uh, sounds like a lot of pressure, right? Um, and you can you can you can reset that course at some point. But I I think. Uh, if you think I got a long career out of me ahead of me, particularly as an architect, it's a long, long career. Uh, you don't want to shoot off in the wrong direction from the beginning. You want to kind of put it in perspective and think, this is the rest of my life. You know, I need to figure out how to to couple uh, what it is I loved about school with what I loved about uh, love about life in general together, and somehow make sure that the that first step that you take is is the right step. Um, but uh, I would just say at the same time, I remember when I was a young, trying to be a young professional, I, oh, I had worked for, I was coming back from Berlin, I was working for this architect in Berlin, and then I was coming back to New York City, and I just, I needed cash. You know what I mean? It was Christmas, I needed cash. I got a job out of the newspaper, and I just started the next day. I, I was lucky to be hired, but then I kept looking for the job I really wanted. So sometimes you need to take just a job. Yeah, and I told my okay. story earlier. I did exactly the same thing. I took a yeah. job I, I knew I didn't want. Yeah. I, I don't think anyone can go wrong taking any job for a year. Yeah. Any job. Corporate, small, barely doing architecture, any job. The the difficulty there is that uh, lots of people take that job and they get comfortable for very re various reasons. Money, yeah. life, it takes a different course, whatever. Like, so people just forget the course that they're on over the course of a year. It's really easy to do yeah. that. Well, the guy I worked for... He was a good guy. It was a fun office, but he, he couldn't offer me full time, full time. He was like, well, this is temporary. And I was like, okay, perfect. This is temporary. I'm going to keep looking. So we kind of had a deal, you know, and then I did keep looking and then I eventually moved, you know, I, I stayed there like three, four months, but I could at least afford my Christmas gifts that year. And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and then I went to Paul Shacks and so forth and got into something I was really yeah, interested in. I think there maybe maybe it's important to to even further caveat the caveats that have already been said, at least from my perspective. Um, you have to know the difference, I would say, and you have to have the maturity to know the difference, or at least be willing to uh, be willing to do, to put in some hard thought. If you take a job, which I I've definitely done as as well, you take a job and you know it's a job, that's one thing. But if you approach what is actually your opportunity to start the trajectory that Duane was talking about as a job, um, and you fail 
to commit yeah. to your own future, that is an opportunity that feels like these things are just going to keep coming, but they don't. There are seasons in your life in which different opportunities emerge. And what I see happening, um, you know, with students that are that have been graduated for 10 years that, you know, that I know from, say, back when I used to teach on the East Coast or whatever, is I, is I see um, uh, how easy it is to actually mistake a short period of opportunity for the status quo that will continue indefinitely. So I would say my number one uh, bit of advice for how to be in an office is once you get into an office where you know that you can learn and where that opportunity is being granted to you and you feel like you have made a consequent decision, you've sought something out rather than just having to take what's available, like Dwayne was saying, the most important thing that you need to do is commit. I'll say that again. I think the most important thing that you need to do is commit. And what I mean by that is um, to start to 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 start to invest time, energy, focus, intelligence, aspiration, care, all of the things that you would give to something that you loved and cared about that were co that was consequent to you, something that felt important, something you felt passionate about, to give all of those things to that opportunity that's in front of you and to begin to invest yourself in that opportunity because what ends up happening is that when you invest your the the person that you're working for she will invest in you and then you end up with a situation where you have mutual investment and when you have mutual investment you're building more than your career you're building your character you're building your relationships you're building your reputation um, and all of those things in a field like architecture particularly your reputation, I will say, those are things that are more consequent than how much money you're making for a particular year or even whether or not you're getting to work immediately on the kinds of projects that you might find interesting. Yeah, fair enough. Um, uh, another thing I would say about it is um, it's not so much, like, I'm not looking for people who want to be in my office, I'm looking for people who want to contribute to what we're doing. Yeah. You know, I'm looking for people who, uh, I don't know, want to be a second set of eyes on everything we're doing. Want to know how to ask the right questions. Want to like, want to try to work as efficiently as possible. Want to try to, uh, uh, um, you know, when a task is finished. They want to hop on the next task, and um, uh, we, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to make a living in architecture, honestly. Um, a lot of us have a bunch of side hustles going on, right? Uh, two, three, four side hustles at a time to make things work and to be able to do the kind of work that we want to do. So when we're in the office, uh, we, 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 we need to accomplish stuff as strategically and effic efficiently as possible. And, and so, uh, you know, that ability to kind of work quickly and uh, uh, not just quickly, but accurately, accurately and quickly is extremely um, valuable. Uh, I remember when I was a young architect, uh, uh, I thought, I literally thought I was going to be fired every day. I literally thought I was going to be fired. And I didn't know. I had no idea how fast I was. I was so fast. There was no, I was never going to be fired. It turns out, like, later on when I had my own firm, I realized, oh, my God. I was, like, I was so fast. I was so efficient. I was so careful and so accurate. I had no idea that that it was already doing all the things I was supposed to do. But the whole time, I was afraid I was going to be fired. It, and of course, I never was. But it, that wasn't very healthy, by the way. I, I wouldn't suggest that for a strategy. But, right. but I remember thinking, like, it, I just remember all the time feeling on edge. But I don't know if that motivated me to work quicker. But, but in retrospect, 
I, when I saw, when I had my own firm and then I saw what I had done, I realized, oh my gosh, I was really fast and really accurate and <laughs> working my butt off. Um, so feeling like you have skin in the game, that you're, you're committed and in, in, in the, the sense that you're really trying to do your best work. Yeah, yeah. I was. Yeah. There was a really different feeling. Um, I, I did an internship in fourth year. There was like a program that my school did. And um, I, I remember coming back to school with a really different feeling about what it meant to be productive. Um, when I was an undergrad, I, I was really like, um, I was the person who was there all night, every night. And uh, and when I went to the office, I uh, this was for... Uh, Peter Boland's office in Pennsylvania, really talented people there, seasoned architects mostly, and uh, they they got up early in the morning, they worked really hard, and they went home at six o'clock at night. Uh, but they worked their butts off, and they um, it was just so it was so different than the way I worked because I'd you know I'd come in and then I'd want to take a walk to the student union and eat, and then I'd kind of kind of mess around and go to class, and I just did a lot of messing around, and I didn't think I was messing around. But man, when I saw how uh, some of these professionals work, it just totally changed my attitude. Um, when I went back to grad school, and it was largely because of the, that kind of lesson of the internship, I was very different. Um, yeah. It's not to say we didn't work hard, but we were like, you know, we went to, we didn't sit in studio and kind of mess around. Not, I'm not saying everybody does that. <laughs> some of you do, because I see the video games going. Uh, but the, the, the point is, like, I, I do think that, uh, you know, you'd learn in an office that there's a there is a more productive way of working than all of you, all of you know. I was the same. I, I you know, I, I still like to mess around some, but uh, there's something to be said for like just learning how to really focus for a period of time, and then like at the end of the day, actually relax and enjoy your life. Yeah. Well, I would also hope that it would not always be so binary that you would be having to treat working in an atelier or a studio, and I like the way that you're using those terms, Margaret, as the thing that you have to get through so that you can enjoy your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, if you know me at all, you know that's, that probably came out wrong. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I, I probably more than anyone would say, like, your life and your work, if you're going to be happy, your life and your work essentially have to become the same thing. I don't know anyone in any profession, and I'm not just talking about architecture, in any profession who really doesn't uh, enjoy their, if, if, you, if they don't consider their job an essential part of their life, they're pretty unhappy at their job. And that's not a, that's not a great way to exist, going to work, disliking your job, and then you know, getting home at the end of the day and saying, whew, I can finally live my life. A uh, horrible way to be. I'd figure out what about your job it is that makes you really happy and accept that that, that is your life. Uh, so you better figure out how to kind of steer it in the way that's going to make you happy every day. Uh, that doesn't mean every minute you're going to be happy. Sometimes you've got to work harder than you want to be. But what should make you happy about it is the reward that comes with, uh, you know, the moments of satisfaction, of completion, of uh, creativity that, you know, are especially uplifting in a creative field like this. Yeah, uh, which is not to say that there's not going to be days when you're like, you know what I mean, um, uh, uh, which, 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 to this day, I'm still having. You know, what I mean, like recently, I had some really challenging things where I'm in our business, where you know, having to do often with contractors, and uh, where part of me was just like, "What am I doing?" You know, what I mean, I, I, I had my class knows. I told them I, I had a couple days couple weeks ago where I was just like I, I want to quit my own office because this stupid <laughs> contractor driving me out of my freaking mind um, but you know now we got our CFO and uh, we're past you know what I mean like <laughs> it's it's working but uh, but there's ups and downs it's like a marriage or whatever or like a partnership like you know it's not all roses uh, when you're doing something e e e even like like we have our firm and it was always my dream to have my own firm and I have it now, but it's not, it's not all roses every day. Uh, there's no, it's definitely not that, some It's not that, that dissimilar from, uh, from parenting, I think. We're all parents at this table and, you know, you, you were like, it's my dream to have a child and, uh, you know, one day you have a child or you have several children. And some, you know, every once in a while you're like, 
This was a horrible mistake. <laughs> um, but on balance, it is one of those, it's a, it, well, I, I don't know, I keep coming back to the word commitment because I liked also what you said about marriage. It's like marriage. Marriage is also a matter of committing through ups and downs. Um, but it's like, but what a terrible thing to commit to if it's not aligned with your passions. Now, fortunately, I will say that there are such a broad range of things to do within this field. Although the field of architecture might seem quite small and quite specific, um, there are so many ways to be part of architecture that I'm very hopeful that even if you start out in a particular role or doing a particular type of thing, you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is terrible, I treat it like a job, I need to go home and do three hours of like loofah, you know, self-care or something just to kind of recover from what I had to do during the day. There's, there's more to come, there's so many ways. You know, you might decide, what if you wake up one day? I just put this on the table. What if you wake up one day and you're like, holy shit, I actually am not that good at schematic design. Schematic design is like the holy grail of like a talented architect. You know, they come in and they're like, that's how it's gonna be, the massing, whatever. Um, what if you wake up one day and you you suddenly realize there are like seven other people in your particular atelier that um, are better than you? And actually, what you really like is kind of organizing and detailing and did, great. Actually, that's super valuable. Being able to put together a neat spreadsheet, being able to <laughs> balance a quantities with qualities, there's uh, being able to, to understand codes and to spec things accurately and carefully, uh, being able to communicate with clients, being able to bring in new clients. If you have the social superpowers to locate and lure in new clients, you have a future, a passionate future in architecture for sure. So I, I, I will say that it, sometimes it takes time to find the things that make it worthwhile to be invested in, in the, the field. Um, and that's one thing that you can really lean into when you're just starting out. As you guys are preparing to enter uh, the profession, you might ask the person that you're working for, hey, could I try this? What about that? I'm wondering if I could do this. If I do a good job on this, could I do that? Um, if you're if you're willing to um, let's say show up <laughs> um, and by the way showing up also includes I think we could probably agree on this showing up includes being on time I know that sounds really simple but being on time <laughs> is very important if you show up and you're it's not like you're half asleep and you're in your pajama bottoms but you actually show up for real um, then, and you say, I'm interested in this, I want to learn about this, I want to try this, or whatever, those things, um, unless you're working for a true um, and rare jerk, will be, will be super valued and, and rewarded. And that's a good way to find where your passions lie. Sorry, I feel like that was long. Um, uh, well, one thing I was going to talk about, mm -hmm. is just in general, is like, going back to like what kind of lessons you want to learn. Um, I don't know, uh, I know that many of you are undergrads, like, I know there seems to be a new trend of a lot of undergrads going straight to graduate school, which I would just say, um, I would maybe think twice about if I was you. Um, I think grad school, obviously, it can be a good thing, depending what your goals are, but when you come out of SciArc with a B arc, you are already so valuable. You don't need grad school. What grad school would be for is if you want to be a teacher, you're gonna you're not gonna get more from grad school, uh, as far as like moving into the profession. But if you do want to go to grad school, and you work for a couple years, say two three years before you go to grad school, you're gonna get so much more out of grad school, because you're gonna be a better student. Because well, when you work in a firm, you gain facility, you gain like I was saying, you gain the ability to work quicker, you, you have an understanding of uh, efficiency and facility, and if, 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 if you work for, say, two, three years and then you go to grad school, your grad school experience will be um, exponentially more valuable to you, I would say. Yeah, I, I don't feel as strongly about not going to grad school, but 100% uh, agree, don't do it right away. Um, yeah, this has been a trend that I, I don't think is a good one. 
Um, I went to, I, I took three years in between undergrad and, and grad, and I, um, during that time I worked for several people, I did a lot of freelancing, super interesting time in my life. Um, after grad school, I thought about the things that I didn't learn prior to grad school, and so after grad school, I'll come back to the grad school part, after grad school, I said I'm going to go work to work for a practicing architect that's doing houses. I want to learn how to make buildings. Um, and I spent another three years there. Um, so there was a little bit of regret there that I didn't, that I didn't learn that. Um, but I, the, the point I want to make about grad school and the break in between, if you go directly from undergrad to grad out of SciArc, um, it effectively becomes, um, given the high level of SciArc, it effectively becomes just an extension of undergrad. You're, you're still in the same mindset. Uh, you're coming right off of, of having worked hard. You're equally as, as tired as you have been for the last five years. It really becomes like an extension. It's like you went for seven years or, you know, whatever, uh, depending on where you, you go to grad school. If you go out and you spend three years doing whatever you do, you go back to grad school a very different person. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, you're, in that three years, you're really going to figure out what you want to learn. Yeah. I don't know if that's totally true for a lot of people. I, I think they just have the ambition, I don't know what it is I'm not, I don't know, therefore I need to go to grad school. That in many ways was my, I was a different person, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to get out of grad school. Um, but what I got out of grad school was a very different perspective because it was so different than where I had gone to undergrad. Uh, I met a, a whole world of people that, that thought differently that were connected to the world differently, that were connected to different cities and different architects. So it was just like everything I, all the connections I had, I, I doubled that and because of, of because I went to an a undergrad in a place that uh, is in the middle of nowhere, uh, it just opened up a world of connections that were so amazing to me. Um, so I didn't know what I was going to get out of it, but I, I got so much more than had I gone out of undergrad. One uh, other thing I'll add to that that I, I don't like to say publicly because it's a little embarrassing, uh, when I got out of undergrad, I applied to three grad schools. I didn't get into any of them, none of them. Um, and I went out and worked three years, and I got into all of them. Uh, and I don't, I, I can't explain entirely why. Uh, I think it had a lot to do with people I worked for uh, in between. But I think I had a different perspective on how to make a portfolio that kind of made sense and was thoughtful. It wasn't clicking off the boxes that people in undergrad had told me, here's what you do to get into grad school. I just I didn't made the portfolio I wanted to make, and I said the things in the statement I wanted to say. I was, I was more an adult. Uh, so wait a little bit. Go out yeah, and become an adult. <laughs> I waited five years. Uh, I mean, I worked for five years uh, before I went to grad school. And I had my license before I went to mm -hmm. grad school. Wow. Mm -hmm. I got my license. And um, when I went to grad school, I was, I just, I was just so much more focused uh, because I, I had to pay for it myself in my family. Grad school is on you and I had to pay for it myself. So it was like incredibly, you know, I was like the year before I went to grad school, I waitressed at night to save up money to, to in addition to working, I worked as an architect and I had a waitressing job at night to make extra money to support my grad school. And um, I wanted to go to grad school because I wanted to be a professor, and um, uh, which is one reason to do it. And I knew I wanted to be a teacher because I knew I wanted to have my own practice. And I thought the two could um, somehow have a symbiotic relationship. Um, I thought teaching and practicing would work together. Um, but those working for that long before I went to grad school, um, it, it changed um, what I was able to do in grad school. I, I was able to do so much more. <clears throat> and I really did know what I kind of wanted to learn. Um, you're also able to understand what networking is as opposed to having your undergraduate relationship with your professors, yeah. which I, I've seen a lot of people. So I, do, I did want to talk for just a second about the financial side of things, too, because I, I recently became aware somebody explained this to me, and I, I, was, I was actually interviewing them, and they, this came out, and they said it was kind of a widespread understanding, so I just wanted to clarify something real fast on that, but then... Um, also, it ties into what both of you are, are making the, the case for. So, sorry. One, just so you guys know, 
it is absolutely not true that you make more money as a starting salary as someone who has graduated from an IMARC right. than someone who has graduated <laughs> from a BARC. There is no bump. There is no, let me just say that again. There is no bump. What you get paid more for is experience. And the kind of experience that's the most valuable is the kind that goes two to three years minimum or three to five years maximum at the same office. Because that's how long it takes to learn anything in this field and to see significant projects through all the way. So the, the three year window, three, five year window that my colleagues are talking about here is a, that's a consequent figure because it allows you to actually gain what then is financially remunerative experience. So that's the first point I wanted to make. Second point I wanted to make is that a lot of times the lure, like the excitement of going to, oh my gosh, I got into Harvard, GSD, or I got into Princeton. <gasps> you know, um, it, it, it maybe can uh, distract you from the fact that you may have already gone into significant student debt, depending on your family situation for your undergrad, and you are now planning on paying to go for two more years or three more years of schooling at a school with a very high tuition rate. Now, even though m most people can qualify for scholarships, those scholarships uh, for a graduate degree today, anyhow, are very rarely going to cover the entire cost of your tuition. At the same time, your undergraduate loans are sitting there compounding interest. And I hope that all of you know what the difference is between simple interest and compound interest. Well, your student loans are compound interest. Okay? So, especially for those of us who, like me, come from very humble financial backgrounds, these are things that are not as immediately apparent. You think, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm lifting myself up out of, the, out of the depths of poverty by going to these illustrious places, but you may not have actually calculated, and they're certainly not going to calculate it for you, right, at the admissions office in a school, what the cost to your future will be. So two, two points on grad school. You're talking, you're, you know, I'm telling you this as somebody who has done a tremendous amount of schooling. Um, but, but I also did a tremendous amount of schooling while I was working <laughs> as, a, as an architect for most of that time, for precisely the same reason that I said. So sometimes the, the, the kind of following the limbings off the cliff can be exactly that. And just because a lot of other people are doing something or because something looks good to you while you're a student or illustrious to you as a student doesn't mean that's how it will actually turn out on the other end. Yeah, I, you know, one, one issue I have no answer for, uh, but I, I feel for the students now is uh, in that three years, who do you go to work for? Because you don't want to go to the one that pays the most because that's probably not the best office for you. Um, so your, your suggestion, I, I completely agree with that point, but it does mean, uh, it's said with the implication that, that you get out of undergrad, you pay off a little of that, or at least you, you know, stop the bleeding, and then you go to grad school because you've worked for those, those three years. Um, but often those three years you want to go out and you want to work for the best, best people you, that you can. And that, you know, depending on the type of office that you really want to go to, often those are not the ones that, that pay the best. Hopefully they're paying you a, a living wage, but things even in the last 10 years are, are they're so different and they're so difficult for students who owe a lot of money coming out of undergrad and, you know, there aren't a lot of good <clears throat> scenarios. Um, but, I mean, I think you, you come out of SciArc, you guys are going to have a lot of skills. You, it's okay if you even go to work for a developer. Like, not everyone wants to be an architect in the same way. There's so many ways to leverage your education as an architect. Um, you can be work as an art director. You can work, you know, for a developer. You can work for a contractor. You can. So, it's it's okay that um, some of you. Uh, maybe you do want to figure in a, a certain amount that you need to make. Others well, of you, you might have more leeway on that. But we know that big offices are going to pay more than small offices, and it's not because small offices try to take advantage. It's just their fees are less. 
you know, in order yeah. for them to compete. Yeah. So Gensler, you know what I mean, they have the biggest fees of anybody in the city and they can afford to pay more. And But if you go to Gensler, uh, maybe you're going to be drawing bathrooms for one year. You know, like there's different lessons that you're going to learn in different kinds of firms. Um, yeah. Well, I, two points. So First of I all, think that's even what I would be choosing. I would be choosing what uh, what is what's the life I envision and what kind of lessons I want to learn. And to me, it's not a right or a wrong with any of that. Like it's personal choice. Agreed. Sorry to cut you. Yeah. I have to cut you off twice. Now I'm, yeah. I apologize. I'll, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, uh, two points. One, uh, even if you're working for the the uh, uh, let's say a boutique uh, office with very good design because you're passionate about the work that they do um, and they're paying you um, design office that's what we call it. like there's design offices and then there are corporate offices and there's what design offices can afford to pay and there is actually a market rate for that and then there's a corporate office rate which is higher which is what you know but it's kind of like you know <laughs> How much of how much of your you know like I was saying before, is it like a forty-hour work week that you can barely get through, or is it a sixty-hour work week that you can't wait to start every day? So you got to choose your poison on that one. You're still making some money as opposed to paying money, and you're still learning just as much. So it's still a better investment, even if you're not able to make as much money as fast as you would like. So I would still say it makes more sense than going to graduate school right away. And second of all, what you'll find is, this is why I was stuck on the, on the commitment thing, and I will double down on that um, as much as I can to all of you over the course of my influence on your lives, as limited as that will be. When you commit to a project, when you commit to a firm, when you commit to a principal and you really invest, they, I guarantee you, they will invest in you. They will pay you as much as they possibly can and be happy to do it. Now, does that mean that you're gonna become um, a millionaire um, in your first 10 years of working uh, uh, with a firm while you apprentice and learn how to start your own business if you so desire? Probably not. But will you feel like you're living a passionate and fulfilled life and you're working hard towards something that matters to you and not something that only matters to some faceless, nameless, late capitalist corporation? Yes. And honestly, I think it's worth the investment because ultimately it's not an investment in them, it's an investment in you. And it's an investment also in our futures. I wanna put two statistics on the table and then I wanna ask my colleagues to respond to it. And this will probably be our last thing before we open it to questions. Two statistics. Um, so every year since about 2010, I believe, the World Economic Forum has compiled going, talking to experts and academics and scientists and business leaders and creative leaders and government leaders and, you know, leaders. Um, They've compiled a list of the greatest global threats facing society, civilization, a peaceful and abundant future. So every year they compile that list. And what they always ask people for one specific type of risk among all the other risks. And that risk is, what is the most underrated threat? In other words, what do you stay up at night worrying about, you know, you great creative leader, you, you know, business, leader or whatever that other people don't seem worried about but you think is going is going to majorly impact us um, and so those those differ every you know sometimes it's like you know nuclear winter and sometimes it's uh, um, uh, rising sea levels well this r most recent round so the last report that was issued the most underrated global threat to our prosperous uh, shared and abundant future was global youth disillusionment And this was based on a number of findings. One of the most was a, a massive study that was done by Lancet, the medical journal, uh, peer-reviewed medical journal, which looked at, I think, 
10,000 youth aged 16 to 25 from all over the world, every continent in the world, and found that 56% or more of people in that age group felt profoundly pessimistic about their own future, about the future of uh, the human uh, species, about the health of the climate, et cetera. And they did not feel very inclined whatsoever to invest in the status quo, seeing as the status quo was what got us here to begin with. Moreover, the kind of deep depression or sort of feeling of not it's not worth it was coming as they asked these questions to all of these youth, was coming specifically from this kind of, this massive sort of anger and confusion and disappointment and astonishment that our, that our governments all across the world have failed to address climate change. That we have just so far at least failed to address climate change. So there's my one statistic. My other statistic um, is um, 56 gigatons per annum of carbon emissions into the atmosphere that need to be reduced to zero by 2050 to avoid catastrophic, irreversible, uh, life-threatening, uh, a permanent climate damage on this planet. 2050, mass youth disillusionment, da da. The reason I bring these up, um, and I can tell you know, you guys know about these things. First of all, you're in that cadre. Most of you are in that cadre, in that, in that age group. Um, and you know, I'm sure, about things like the lay flat movement in China, for example, or the mass resignation um, that's happened in, in the West in recent times. Um, so on one hand, we've got something that we know very well, we sense. By the way, we also sense it as employers and we sense it as teachers. Um, and we sense it as parents, too. And on the other hand, we've got one of the greatest challenges to humanity that we have ever known, certainly that has ever occurred in a way that we have known about and it's been consequent for us in our lifetimes, which will require massive, creative, disruptive, astonishing change, including, by the way, a great deal of design. So I'm putting those two things out. They're both related to the same underlying issue. They are, you know, on the one hand, uh, a, a kind of, um, I, I would say, understandable reluctance to invest, to get involved. And on the other hand, a certainty that that is the only way forward unless your way forward is no way forward at all. What do you guys think about that in terms of hiring, in terms of the future of the field, You're in terms first. of the profession? <laughs> what do you see in young, in young professionals that come to your office? I don't know how to tie those two together. Yeah, uh, me either. In, in, in quite that way yet. Um, I, I said something earlier and I, it just made me feel like, wow, I'm really a, a, a Debbie Downer about you know the financial situation in your in, and I just wanted to say I um, it would be disingenuous di disingenuous of, of us not to acknowledge the your pain <laughs> and so that's why I say that is as I think we understand that and we didn't face that same kind of thing and uh, so while I can be a Debbie Downer it's largely because I, I want to you know express what I actually feel wait what, what didn't we face well, when I when I said something about uh, the we we didn't face the sa same financial difficulty they did. I'm from a poor family. You're all from 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 those kind of families. You had to pay for your own education. But paying for your own education 20 years ago was really different than paying for your own education through undergrad and grad today. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I, I had to figure I, out how to do it all on my own, but I I could. And I think right. most people going to schools like Syracuse and Ivy League, I I don't know how you do it on your own today. Side hustle. I'm going to repeat it. Side hustle. <laughs> Several side hustles. Um, it'll get you part of the way. But any, uh, the reason I bring this up is because I, I think that um, while I want to be realistic about those things, I also am just in general incredibly optimistic as a person. 
and I think um, I think that uh, this whole idea that that uh, I haven't heard that statistic about the, the yeah. disillusionment. Um, I I personally am not sure that you could tie it directly to climate change. You could probably there there. I think it's part of a larger package of global problems that my generation and the generation before me have dumped on this one along with the ability to for, for everyone to else immediately and instantaneously to understand that everyone else has problems therefore I do uh, you know I, I'm saturated with the problems of the world uh, I, I just I think you've got to be really careful not to let those take over your mindset not does that mean ignore climate change no quite quite the opposite it's that that your generation that an older generation is not going to be here at some point. This is going to be your world. And if, if the idea that disillusionment is what results from that challenge is, is profoundly <laughs> upsetting, uh, you know, what should come from it is a kind of optimism that you're going to be in charge someday and that somehow you're going to take over the, the problems that our generations have failed to, to fully address. So I don't know. I, there was a really weird mix of optimism and pessimism in that response, but... Uh. No, well, okay, so that I will piggyback on. Um, I would say that optimism, uh, if I weren't optimistic, I wouldn't be where I was today. You know, like, optimism is one of my most important superpowers. Uh, in my family, I'm one of the most optimistic ones in my family, and... You know, you all know who my partner is, which is John. He tries to be as optimistic as I am, but he, 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 he he's a little bit more of a realism realist. But um, optimism is the single most important, uh, not crutch, but thing that I rely on to, to move forward. Um, I guess it, I would call it optimism combi combined with this, like, get shit done, okay? The number one thing is just get shit done. Doesn't matter what you're doing, get shit done. And be, I don't know, like uh, the ability, I think what I learned in architecture school is I learned how if, if, if I work hard enough, I can get shit done. And I can, I can get shit done in this level, and this level, and this level, and this level. I can just get shit done here, get shit done here, get shit done here, get shit done here. And then suddenly all the shit's done. Like, like just, Getting stuff done comes from action, and I don't know. I don't overthink. Uh, I don't know the way that I deal with my thoughts about where the world is going is. Uh, I'm gonna go to space one day. I want to go to the moon. I want to be on that spaceship that uh, all they're all designing. I uh, believe in technology. I believe in the advancement of technology and. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure I can save the planet, but I, I, I don't know. I don't mind being on the first plane out of it. Now, I can tie that back to, <laughs> to being in an office. I can say that, that um, the most valuable people in the office are the people who get shit done. And I don't by that, I don't mean people who uh, are the, always the hardest workers. That's right, yeah. It's, it's if I say, uh, man, how are we going to get this installation from our backyard to hanging in space and you know the middle in the Midwest, uh, and somebody comes back a couple days later and says, "I found a trucking company that'll do it for this amount." Uh, I called a person in Columbus, Indiana. Uh, they've got riggers that'll get a forklift out there, and they've solved all these problems that I hadn't even anticipated. Uh, it's that person who's actually thinking, like, "How do I solve the problems that they haven't even thought of yet?" Yeah. That are unbelievable and it it often i said this in the last one, last panel i was sitting on they often picked up the phone yeah the yeah. phone uh yeah if even, i can tell you not anything. to say don't email but pick up the phone it's amazing no in my office it's like if you email someone you you call them five minutes after you email them yeah. you don't wait two days later and they didn't get oh i emailed them two days ago they didn't get oh, back yes, to me I well, well call them yeah call them call them this morning call them to uh, afternoon Call them tomorrow morning. Like, call them until you talk to them. Yeah. yeah. By the way, the, the person who figures that out and you does call and you kind of isn't just kind of like, well, I emailed. Those are the people that get the raises. Well, the um, people get shit done. So be a closer. 
be be like a closer. I, I think we had better open it up to questions. Otherwise, we're going to get some exciting colors um, dumped on us. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Um, so I think that we've all felt the very public push for um, like mass advocacy and mass action as of late, especially in terms of global climate change. And I'm wondering how you guys think that that affects, or do you think that that affects the um, youth disillusionment? And do you think that's a negative or positive effect that it has? So I, I think that it's an entirely positive uh, uh, fact. It's one of the things that makes me, op speaking of optimism, it's one of the things that makes me optimistic about your generation is the ability to push in consequent quick ways through mass collaboration for a consequent change. Part of that is technological, but also part of that is just massive social intelligence that I think far outstrips our generation. Um, where I think the kind of the, the mass disillusionment thing is, is factors into that is when when we are faced with a problem that seems to be more enormous than what we can imagine finding a solution for, it can lead to some pretty nihilistic thoughts. And for me, the idea of mass collective action that we see uh, in your generation is one of the great pushbacks against that kind of nihilism. You know, ni nihilism is, is, um, is small thinking. You won't find creative people who are nihilistic in their approach to their future. You will find creative people like Margaret and Duane who are deep optimists. Not naive optimists, but optimists in the sense of being ingenious, creative, engaged, in the world that they find. Yeah, like I can't identify with disillusionment. I can't, I, I can't even identify with that. And I don't see it to be, uh, I don't know, I, I don't see it generational. Uh, my daughter is your age, okay? My daughter is exactly your age. And I don't know, her friends, I, maybe it's just who am I around, even my students in the class, I, I don't see a lot of disillusionment. Uh, but maybe you have it. I, I don't. I don't find it helpful. So I can't. Disillusionment, uh, for me, is a useless uh, expenditure of energy and time. I, I can't afford to be disillusioned. I, I have to. Uh, I just have to go onward and upward and get shit done. <laughs> I, I yeah. can't even. <laughs> well, clearly, what has has. Um the idea that, that there is a kind of uprising around social justice issues, obviously what caused those is leading to a lot of disillusionment. How could it not? It, you know, uh, it's the idea that, that this has kind of come to the fore and people are rising up against this that is what's so positive and, and uplifting. Uh, the, but what the, the, what's left though is it's too damn slow. You know, so like how could that also not lead to some disillusionment? So, you know, you go out there, you keep fighting for it, and, uh, you know, you get a little frustrated when you don't win every battle. Uh, but you, you keep insisting, it's moving too damn slow. I mean, I, like, I think about how this lifted, you know, a lot of architects, uh, you know, people like Tom and, and Eric talk about um, the resistance that drove their work in the 60s and 70s into the 80s. And, you know, it, 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 I don't think of, of the way we work as a form of resistance, and they always want that. What's your form of resistance? <laughs> You know, they don't understand how we wake up in the morning without a feeling of resistance, but I just don't operate that in that way. But somehow that brought them like a feeling that uh, a very positive, optimistic view of the impact that they could have on the world. And so I, I think this, my hope is that your generation feels that kind of fervor and, and drive from a form of, of resistance. Yeah, I guess maybe part of my attitude about it comes from the fact that, you know, I was a young female architecture student in the 80s, the early 80s. This was not an easy time to be a girl in the architecture field. And I had to overcome a lot of bullshit, honestly. And if I had 
I, like I had no time to be disillusioned. I had no, it, it, it's in that regard that I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for it because I needed to overcome so many things. And that's where my optimism really helped me because not only am I optimistic, but sometimes I'm naive. So sometimes I don't know if someone like, like, let's say I'm on site and there's a contractor and he doesn't think I know what I'm talking about. Well, I'm so naive that I don't know that. I, I just think he's an idiot. And maybe he, you know what I mean? Like, so I, I didn't have time to worry about what others, um, like disillusionment wouldn't have helped me. So the only way I could help me was to like overcome any obstacle that was put in front of me. And there was a lot of obstacles. So the only way to overcome all those obstacles was to be slightly naive and um, very, very optimistic. And then just don't stop. Just like never give up. Mm -hmm. I would say those three things is, uh, was part of the secret sauce for me. Um, hi. Um, I feel like what you just said is kind of probably going to answer my question <laughs> a little bit. But um, so I, I just I am like being here at this school, I, I struggle with because um, I also work in the field and I, I struggle with, um, I guess, separating work from school um, in the sense where like when I design um, kind of like the building that I'm doing right now, um, there's a lot of space that I feel like is really unusable or um, just really weird. Um, but, you know, the professor says, oh, no, you can do this or that. So I guess you could say, how do I, I guess, merge the lines um, or just, you know, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. How do I, like, merge the lines together? For, for me, it would be not, not try to merge it right now. Let it be compartmentalized for a moment. Because I think sometimes what we're maybe working on in school, and uh, this is a case for my students is I'm working on stuff in the studio here at school that we can't always do in, in practice at the office. So we're trying to uh, work on things that are beyond what we can maybe do in our practice. And so maybe you have to suspend your animation for a moment, right? And, and allow yourself to have kind of two ways of thinking about things. And it doesn't mean that you, um, that the things that you're doing in work are wrong. And it doesn't mean that the stuff you're doing in school is wrong. It's just that it's Perhaps it's, it's two different parts of your brain for the moment that eventually, as you gain more facility, will be merged and will be able to then work together. But to try to merge it now might be premature, would be my take. Yeah, when you first started answering that, I thought, oh, I would, I would not answer it that way. But by the time you, got, <laughs> you were finished, I, I'm completely on board. I, I think, uh, you know, if I'm talking to a, a, uh, an architect with a lot of... Uh, experience if I'm talking to these two I say you absolutely have to merge those two you know if you can't take your design yeah, ambition right. yeah. and figure out how to give it real meaning in, in a way on the most practical mundane level real meaning that, that enriches it in some way uh, wh wh what are you doing but I do think that there is a point as you're developing as an architect where you do have to kind of set what you know aside and go like I'm gonna pretend that doesn't exist to try to get to a different place and eventually merge those two. You know, I use a, a example of music. Uh, I'm not a, a great musician, but I, but I I grew up playing a certain kind of music. And at some point in my life, I wanted to learn a very different kind of music. And I pretend, and I was pretty good at this other thing. That and I just said, I'm going to pretend I don't know that. I'm going to start over. And Jenny kind of looked at me as I'm learning one note at a time, going, "What are you doing? This is insane." Uh, but Five, ten years later, those two things became completely merged. I can't separate the two now. And the hope is that at some point, those th those things become fluid, and you're you know you're able to improvise between the the two sides of your brain, as Margaret puts it. Yeah, I, when I was doing my undergraduate, I it, which was my professional degree, it was a BARC. Um, I was going to school, it, it, honestly the only way I could even begin to afford um, college was I, I went to school at night, I was at a night school that was designed to let you work full time during the day. So I was working at a firm during the day and then I was being asked to do these really zany things at night, so maybe something similar to what you're describing. And about halfway through I had a professor who was really good. There weren't, like not all my professors were really good, but this one was really good. And she said to me, she said, Marika, right now, 
the only way you're going to get the maximum value out of this education, out of the studio, is if you learn to suspend your disbelief. You can't come into it with a kind of judging mentality where you are trying to already assess the value of what you're being taught and even think about how you might change it. Set that aside for now, you can do that later. Right now, suspend your disbelief and just approach it with wonder and curiosity and take what you can. And for those students that are my students this semester, you may have heard me saying something similar to you. It was a great life lesson for me and it's, it's proven to be valuable over the years in many different contexts. The more of your future, including I would say working in someone else's firm, by the way, as you gain experience and, and as you learn to do the things that you're passionate about, the more of your life that you can approach with a sense of wonder and openness and curiosity rather than surety, judgment, a sense of ideologically knowing already what the right thing is to do, the faster you will grow into the best version of yourself. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. A sense of childlike wonder uh, is what I see in, in the, the, my favorite uh, architects who are not young, I'm not going to uh, call them the other word, are those who still have a sense of childlike wonder. It's, it's such a beautiful thing, and it applies to every aspect of life. And with that, I think, oh, one more. Okay, one more, and then, and then we'll, Elliot, and then we'll, we will close it. Perfect. So I want to kind of backtrack the conversation to the first question that was asked about sort of commitments and the ethics around commitments. Um, I kind of disagree with the point about commitment that was brought up earlier on. I think in some cases you are put in situations where it is okay to break a commitment, especially when the commitment you thought you were getting into is not the one you're actually into in the end. Um, I was recently put in that situation, unfortunately, so had to break a commitment. Um, but I don't think that should in any way sort of affect this idea of reputation. And I do believe that I just, I was lucky enough to just have a conversation with Hernan and John about this. I think that sort of attitude and behavior is why architecture and the profession as a general is really lagging behind so many other fields in terms of pay, salary, and work-life balance, etc. So, yeah, I think I just, I, want, I also believe um, that it's a subject that's not really talked about at the school a lot, and um, Hernan and John agreed with that and committed that they were going to sort of try to approach that with students a little bit more. But, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, what do you think are the factors that are still causing architecture to really lag behind other fields? <clears throat> well, there's a lot to unpack, but uh, let's just go to the issue of, uh, uh, okay, I come from a place of we all make our own choices, right? I don't get to do your choices, you don't get to do my choices, my daughter doesn't make my choices, I don't make her choices, I don't make my, you know what I mean? I come from a place of everyone makes their own choices, so I think that's what you have to do. Everyone has to make their own choices. There's so many things you can do. There's so many ways you can extend your education. And to me, I go back to that. That is what your career should be about, is how do you create your own future, your own education for your future, whatever that is. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. If your education that you want is being at Gensler, if your education that you want is you want to be an owner's agent, if your mm -hmm. education that you want is you want to work for a developer, you want to work for a contractor, like, all those options are equally valid in my mind and there's not I don't I don't I wouldn't put a judgment on that myself um, uh, there's things that I need for people that want to work with us and there's things that the people who want to work for us they, they they want from us so it's like whatever situation you get yourself into it's mutually it ought to be mutually beneficial and if it's not then it's not the right fit so I think that office culture or studio culture is, it's, there's thousands of kinds of cultures that you could get involved in and then and, and, uh, there's not a right or a wrong. There's not, 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 nothing is more better than another thing. It's just like whatever fits for you. And your education as an architect, especially at a place like SciArc, sets you up for I don't know, just thousands of ways that, that you, you could be an entrepreneur, you can, you know, start an ice cream business, you can start printing, 3D printing food, like there's so many SciArc graduates that have gone on to, so, you know, there's art directors, there's like, 
you could basically do anything you want with your education. So I, I don't know. To me, it, I think it's more about choices than anything else. And we all get to choose our own choices. Mm -hmm. And yep. that's all you get. You don't get to choose other people's choices. I, I think we could mostly agree that the idea of commitment in general to anything you do, whether you're an athlete or a, 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 a rock star or whatever, the, the general idea of committing to a thing is, is often what makes you great at it and makes you get better at it. But is commitment unconditional? No. You can find yourself in situations where, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, what makes the profession um, lag behind? You know, there are a lot of things. I, I, I think um, more than anything, it's, I said I was anti-AIA earlier, kind of half-jokingly. Mm -hmm. I think it's largely that it, it as a profession has uh, tried to dig itself into territories that have... Um, that have lacked its value as a creative effort that contributes something. And I think we ought to be fighting to regain that, that value. Um, and when we do that, we ought to insist on being paid for that value. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, often we're, a lot of value is found in what you get paid. Uh, it's, not, it's not meant to be that way, but uh, unfortunately we live in a world where money defines a lot of things. Uh, and so we got to fight for that. It'll give us cultural value back, uh, unfortunately, you know. But so we got to fight for it. We got value. We got to fight for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I, I wouldn't agree that we lag, quote unquote, lag behind. Yeah, that's uh, maybe not. I don't, I don't know that you meant in exactly those terms, but there, there are cases where we're struggling to find our cultural value in the way uh, certain fields can. Well, like, for instance, I, uh, as I uh, one thing, uh, so my daughter's a mathematician, okay? If you're in STEM, you can make crap loads of money. But she's choosing to work for a firm for less money because that firm is going to give her more responsibility. So she could work for a different firm where she could make more money, like her roommate, but my, she's choosing to work for a firm where she's not going to make as much money, even though she's a mathematician, but she's going to get more responsibility. She's going to meet the clients. She's going to have more uh, a voice at the table. So this choice happens in all fields. It's not a choice only in architecture. It's That's a choice true. in every single field you can have. Yeah. And it has, again, it has to do with about what kind of lessons do you want to learn. And it's especially true in any field that involves creativity. True in every field, but especially those that involve creativity because it's easier to find reward in those and therefore people are willing to make greater sacrifices to do them. Hmm. So, yeah, so I don't, I don't think it's a problem exclusive to architecture, these sorts of choices that one makes about yeah. what kind of career you have. I think any career that you could possibly have, there's, uh, there's going to be different ways that you can take it, and there's going to be different situations where you have to evaluate reward versus, and there's different ways to evaluate that. Uh, so uh, I would just say that, a lot of professions have that same exact issue that we see in architecture having to do with like a big firm versus a smaller firm, what you get to work on on a big firm, what you mm -hmm. get, the kind of responsibilities you can have at a smaller firm, the kind of opportunities. So it's just, it's all about choices. It's all about setting up what, what you want to learn, mm -hmm. how you want to learn. And it's also raising the, the issue too, which is good that you put it on the table, Elliot, that, that it's it is really important um, to make sure that you know what expectations are on both sides at the beginning of a you know be, of, of starting to work for somebody, or also on you know on on our side as as employers of bringing somebody on. So having being very open and, and frank in conversation right at the beginning is I think a really important thing that sometimes I think um, students are um, or are young uh, uh, young professionals can be a little bit frightened to talk about stuff like opening like well but do you really have health insurance or you know like what whatever the the, the worry is um, and I would just encourage you to just be to to, to lean in and, and, and be very open and ask lots of questions at the beginning so that things feel clear and, and also so that you know that what you're choosing is the right fit at the right time. I have one last question. Um, 
So you said that, so Margaret, you said that, you know, people can make their own choices. Um, but what do you think about how the system is set up in the way that a lot of architecture students, when they graduate, they work in, they work for like an unlivable wage and then they still have to do side hustle, but it still doesn't pay the, the bill. And at the same time, the majority of the students in SciArc are international students and they cannot work outside of school. And they make like under $500 a month. So there's no way that we can, you know, afford SciArc, just do side hustle. So what do you mm. think about the whole system being set up in the way that we felt like we're not getting the most out of it and we being feel like we've been tricked into, you know, working in this field and have so much expectation and fulfillment, but we don't, those expectations are not met in the industry. Uh, I, well, I don't think it's a system. I don't think it's a, um, it, there's plenty of places where you can go and again, make a, a uh, I don't know, there's Orange County, there's Irvine, there's lots of places you can go in a bigger firm, you can make plenty of money. Uh, uh, I, I would just say that um, all of us sitting at this table made choices as well, right? So I, y y y you just have to do you, okay? Whatever that means. If doing you means you don't wanna be an architect, you don't do it. Um, if doing you means you wanna be an architect, then you, uh, uh, work with wherever you can get yourself into. Um, I don't think that, um, I, I can't speak to what you're talking about because my office doesn't work that way. So I, I, I don't exactly know what you're talking about, but, um, but I, I just think that, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 there's probably plenty of things I could be doing that I could make a lot more money at. But um, I personally have developed the side hustle so that I can do what I like and then have choices about what I like. So um, I, I don't have to take on projects that I don't want to work on. Um, I purposely made my own firm so that I could do what I like. Like, you, you just, I positioned myself so I could have my own firm. Um, I, I, I just think everyone has to carve out whatever it is that you want to do, but I, I don't agree that there's not opportunities out there. I, I don't think that's true. And um, uh, it, it, it's not, you know, getting a job is, is, is never easy. I mean, um, uh, I, I, I had my first job when I was 16 years old. I always had a job, right? I started saving money since I was 16 years old um, so that I could, I, I saved money uh, for many, many years, even before I started to be an architect, I had savings from when I was a kid, from working as an industrial seamstress. So it's just like, whatever it is, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my daughter had a job when she was 16. In, in her generation, barely anyone had jobs. So like, John had a job when he was 12 years old. He started uh, a paper route, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I can't, I, I'm not identifying with your question because I, I don't, uh, I think there's plenty of ways for your education to have value, uh, whether that's in the field or not in the field, but, but even in the field. I, I, don't, I don't think it's infeasible for you to uh, have value from your education, but if you feel that way, then maybe you're in the wrong field. I, I don't know. I don't know how else to answer it, but... Um, I think that's true. Many of us uh, you know, figured out how to, to work in a corporate office for a little while and then take that short-term gig for a little while to because we wanted that experience and you know should you should you work that whatever it is five hundred dollar a month job after school long term no no you know but can you find value in a short term um, uh, job for a little while yeah possibly I hope so but long term no yeah maybe even never you know maybe even never maybe you never work for you know what I mean again no one is saying that you should do that like, it's all about choices, right? It's all about what you set yourself up to do. Like, no one is saying that you should do that. Um, you know? Like, it, it's not more... It, again, uh, there was many times when I was an architecture student, I waitressed in the summer so I could make more money because you can make crap loads of money waitressing, right? But because I didn't have a lot of architecture internships when I was in undergrad, that's why I worked for five years before I went to grad school. You know, I didn't, I didn't have a, an architecture um, internship 
ever when I was in undergrad. I, I didn't have one until after I graduated. Um, and then I did go to Berlin and I did work for $500 a month for uh, uh, three months and that was my choice. And, and I could fund that because I had waitressed for five summers before and I had extra cash that I had saved for all that time. And I chose to fund it. And then I came back and I, I had that on my resume and then I got a proper job, you know? Like, so mm. it, it, it's all about crafting your path. Um, and then, you know, doing it the way you want to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not a right or a wrong, but... Um, uh, and as I said, I even worked as a waitress when I had a job as an architect because I, I made so little in my job as an architect in a place where I had a lot of responsibility that, I, that it wasn't enough and I had a waitress at night to save money for my grad school. But that was my choice, you know. It, and I saved enough money to go to grad school and then I didn't have student debt after I went to grad school. And then, so, uh, but... Then eventually, as I got older, I started to try to figure out more other kinds of ways of getting, gaining financial freedom, like stocks, buy stocks. Yes, <laughs> that should be our next base camp is Margaret Griffin, how to invest as an independent woman. Um, all right, guys, thank you so much for coming to this base camp. Thank you to Margaret and to Duane. Um, and I, I think we are having a, um, a holy festival is going to take place right about now, which sounds great. We should all stick around for it.